Why does God regulate our worship so much? We're going to talk about that and other things here on Wake Up to the Bible. Um, I'm Daniel Kaplan. I'm here with my father, Dr. Kaplan. We're reading through the books of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy over the course of this year. Today, we are reading Exodus, what is it? What chapter are we on? 28. I know, I, I sound so prepared. Exodus 28, and we're going to read 31 through 43. I'm going to read through the All Robert Alter translation, and then we will discuss what we have read. And you shall make the robe for the ephod pure indigo, and the opening for the head shall be in the middle of it. Its opening shall have a woven work border all around, like the opening of a coat of mail it shall be. It must not tear. And you shall make on its hem pomegranates of indigo and purple and crimson on its hem all around, and golden bells within them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he serves, so that its sound be heard when he comes into the sanctum before the Lord, and when he goes out, that he shall not die. And you shall make a diadem of pure gold and a grave upon it with the seal engravings holy to the Lord. And you shall put on it an indigo strand that it may be on the turban and the, at the front of the turban it shall be. And it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear off any guilt from the holy things that the Israelites consecrate from all their holy gifts. And it shall be on its forehead perpetually for their acceptance before the Lord." And you shall weave the tunic checkwork linen, and you shall make a linen turban, and a sash you shall make of embroider's work. And for Aaron's sons you shall make tunics, and you shall make sashes for them, and headgear you shall make for them for glory and for splendor. And you shall dress them, Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, and you shall anoint them, and you shall install them, and consecrate them, that they serve me as priests. And make them linen breeches to cover their naked flesh from the hips to the thighs they shall be. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come into the tent of meeting, or when they approach the altar to serve in the sanctum, that they do not bear guilt and die, a perpetual statute for him and for his seed after him. All right, so we got more instructions, and this gets to kind of this overarching question that I brought up, and that is why, you know, what is going on with all of this uh you know, rigidness, right? All the time you have, don't do this or you die, and don't do this or you die, and all of this. You know, why is it so important that these, what seem like arbitrary details are followed? What do you think? Well, you're dealing with, with a, a uh, carnal nation. I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but these are not uh, overall you know this is just a, a group of normal people right but god has chosen them to be an example and if worship is not regulated in this way it can really descend into all kinds of bizarre and self-destructive kind of behaviors as we've seen if we study the worship of people what happens in 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 in, in uh, religion over the centuries uh, the kind of things that happen for example killing of children and uh, you know, uh, just in sexual uh, uh -huh. activities and so on. Right. So we there needs to be a regulation of worship. Uh, can you really get out of hand? Yep. And I would say, uh, to some degree, that's where you end up with these fights, kind of the high church and the low church sort of people, you know, the people that want like a lot of pageantry, a lot of ritual, a lot of rigidness, and then the people that want to be very relaxed and open and free. And I think both systems can have their problems, right? Because a high church can actually perpetually do something wrong over and over again, or not a very good system, or be so rigid as to create superstition about ritual and things like that. But on the other hand, the other can go off on all kinds of tangents, and uh, you can really miss the mark. And I'll put in a little plug, because <laughs> I have a video on here about church services. It's on our channel. And uh, to some degree, th if you want to watch one of those videos and be like, wow, why is Daniel so bent out of shape? Well, one reason I am bent out of shape is because I think a lot of these things do matter a lot. And I think, you know, if you look at the severity, right, the severity of not taking worship seriously on these very fine point details means that you're worthy of death. I think we need to be a little bit more careful with what we are approaching God with in our church services, right? I feel like we, uh, especially in the Protestant world, I feel like there's a sense that, well, if it isn't a sin, it's okay. Well, there's nothing sinful 
about a lot of these things, except that in the context of you can't do it in this context, it's sin, right? Because it is a sin in here because he says, don't, you know, this is the way you have to do it. But in a normal situation, it's not like, well, if I don't wear this particular outfit, I'm sinning, right? So we need to be careful. Worship is not just about what is sin. It's about what is sin in worship. And that is another question altogether. And I feel like we have pushed so far in the freedom side and we're we're kind of missing the narrative. The narrative is never that. The narrative is never that relaxed in terms of worship, in my opinion. I mean, about the, the, the biggest argument you can have for that is later when you have David prancing around and he's worshiping and then he's criticized for it and then there's judgment on that. Besides that, everything else in the Bible is very much, you know, be strict. So that's kind of the balance that the Bible gives you. But Well, David's you know, situation was not a formal service. It was a procession taking the ark of... Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. It was his casual worship. It wasn't yeah, right. it was not a it was not a corporate worship, right? right, right. Yeah, it's true. But but in general though, what you see a lot is the opposite. What you see a lot is, you know, and sometimes it seems very like I said, almost arbitrary, right? It's like you put a pinky out of line. And to some degree that's one reason why people will criticize, you know, the old testament perspective and make it seem really antiquated and God is so mean and all that. And it's just awful to, to take that perspective. But one reason I think they do is because they don't like the idea of that respect and that, that lifting up and that, that caution and all of that. And it's sad because I've, I don't know why you wouldn't want to be. Cautious. I've seen terrifying things. Uh, I was, <laughs> my son helped me out. See, I, I, I was watching this, this service, uh, in Africa, where everybody was falling backward, and oh, like you know, a Pentecostal. If you fall backward, that's wrong. If you're worshiping God, you're going to go forward. If you're right. falling backward, you could really hurt yourself. Right. right. So anyway, all these people were falling backward, right. and I, I. It's also physiologically normal to fall. And and, and 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 I thought, I thought it was de demonic influence, but then my son told me, no, you can just psychologically, de yep. you know, de uh, bring up that about that behavior. It doesn't yep. it doesn't have to be a supernatural thing. Yep. So, uh, but right. either, but either way, I I just just don't think. But the appropriateness that, of it, right? Appropriateness let's of say it. let's say that I can psychologically manipulate you into a state and get you into a trance and make you fall backwards. Why why would that be something that is appropriate for worship? You know, you might say, okay, as a therapy, you know, you go to a psychologist and that might help you, or you might help you. But is that really, you know, the the idea that that's a tool that we should be using for our worship yeah. is not really in, in, in right. it's not really in harmony with the Bible. Right. And it doesn't seem to be very respectful of the concern right. of what bad practices might Right. Yeah, because people do get the wrong idea from that. Because yeah. you took a spiritual component to that, you know, right. and people would take it one way or the other, you know. And I think there really was no spiritual component to that. I think it was completely physiological. Right. But but if you did, you could be like, well, God wants me to fall backwards. And what does that say about, what does that say to your theology, right? That you worship a God that wants you to have this sense of lack of control and can really injure yourself through some sort of, manifestation you know what i mean you can get a very distorted perspective and you compound that over and over again and you know you start to worship a different god in a sense um you it's a very distorted view and it's very unfortunate the pastor general when i was when i was in my youth our pastor general spoke about uh his exposure to uh pentecostal people doing what what they call the holy laugh yep oh um, yeah I've never, I don't, fortunately. You've I've never ne seen that? I don't think I've ever seen Oh, that. I've seen it. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My poor son. What do you mean? Yeah. I find it psychologically very fascinating. Uh, yeah, right, you're just <laughs> Yeah. The difference is the difference is as I look at it and I'm looking at the hypnotism, the way that they're, you know, the physiological reasons. And if you're Pentecostal and this bothers you, well, feel free to contact me at any time and I can walk you through what is going on from a physiological standpoint and why it is completely normal. There's nothing supernatural about it whatsoever. Anybody can do it. Um, yeah, people can train themselves. I could do it if I wanted to. Um, I know how to. Um, so... I mean, theoretically, I've never done okay. it, but I know how to do it. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs>
<laughs> but no, but the point is, is that, again, if you worship a god that you believe is going to make you have uncontrollable physiological responses, mm -hmm. then theologically speaking, that's going to give you a different perception, right? Yeah. And what you'll notice with these sort of practices is what they'll look for is some sort of external sign and the external sign is usually rather shallow and it's not really very beneficial right it doesn't really give you any wisdom or truth it tends to give you a high yeah. so it's more similar to something like drugs yep. and uh that's that's problematic right. god is not trying to smooth out the problems with our life by making us completely intoxicated. Now, I know it says, you know, whatever, be intoxicated with the spirit and not wine or something like that, but it, it doesn't mean like that. It doesn't mean like we should be in the same manner, <laughs> right? It means we should be as enraptured with the pursuit right. of wisdom as we are with, you know, right. so... Yeah. Uh somebody's saying I should do a video on that. I should I I I would, except I really don't have that skill set exactly. Like I, I I stand on the shoulders of giants who are much better at the human brain than me. So um, you know. But you can find that stuff out there, you know, if you want to know. Or talk to a psychologist, you know, talk to and you could be like, well, they're a skeptical atheist. Okay, fair enough. But you could at least get their perspective and understand, you know, maybe what's going on. Because a lot of them will completely, you could show it to them and they're not going to be like, I'm befuddled. How could this happen? They'll be like, oh, well, that's this, 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 this. you know, because it's not that weird to them. It's I'd, really li I'd like to make an additional comment. Yes. God does promise that the, the uh, priesthood and the Levitical line would, would, would endure. And, and, right. and it has. Yes. And the way the Jews have have done that is that uh, through history uh, if you were a part of a Jewish community if you were a priest there's certain things you could or couldn't do right if you were a Levite there's certain things you were supposed to do and so this was passed on uh, and it, it, it was important in the community to keep in mind who was a priest and who was a Levite mm -hmm. so you have two priests talking to you today and and this is because of uh, customs within the community and finally, uh, some centuries ago, I, I don't know, maybe two, three hundred years ago, when the Jews were forced to take family names, uh, men, the priests would take names like Cohen, Kaplan, uh, and then also Saperstein, Sapphire Stone coming from the, mm -hmm. the, the, and so on. You know, so they were, they were family names that identified priests and Levites. You have Levi and Levine as last names and mm -hmm. so on. And um, so... The priesthood and uh, uh, the Levites and priests have have maintained uh, their identity over the centuries. And recently, DNA tests have confirmed, at least in the general sense, that many of those who, who are said to be priests do have some kind of common ancestry. There's been some DNA studies done on that. Mm -hmm. You can consult those. Uh, if you, if, you know. Yeah, no, I believe mm -hmm. that. I believe that that's true. Um, from what I understand... Uh, there, you can see that there has been this preservation of, of intermingling, as it were, and families and and stuff like that. There's, there's, they're more homogenous uh, than <clears throat> you would expect, you know, randomly. They're, they're for sure. Um, all right. Uh, there's some interesting symbolism going on here, though, that kind of gives nuance to religiosity. And that, and and I'm gonna maybe be a little controversial here, so hang on. Um, so one thing that I think God goes out of His way to do with religiosity is separating uh, sexual activity from worship, which is something that was a big problem. You know, people would have orgies and stuff, prostitutes, because again, of course, sexuality is a way to create a high, and and certainly there is a spiritual component to sexuality, and the Bible has a lot to say about that. But within a corporate environment, you know, within a worship environment, the idea that you would use such, just like I don't think you should use hypnotism, I don't think you should use sexual behavior as a way to try to reach God in some sort of perverted sort of sense. Um, uh, and you'll see here that it goes out of its way to talk about modesty, uh, you know, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But one thing I will say is it's not completely asexual either. In that, if you look at some of this imagery, uh, for example, the pomegranate is definitely uh, a symbol that is used sexually throughout the Bible and throughout culture. Um, and uh, there's a certain amount of, what you call it, fertility 
symbolness to it. Um, which you have to wrestle with. What does that mean? I'm not saying, therefore, you can throw out what I just said about a division. There clearly is a division, right? But there, but it is interesting that a symbol like that with the provocative nature of the pomegranate would be in, in, in involved. Uh, it's something that you need to wrestle with in terms of the nuance of what that means. And that's not something I see a lot of people do. What do you think? Okay, no, I, 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 that wasn't where I was focusing on <laughs> with the, when I when I looked said about the pomegranate. But you have a point, right? And and see, Israel, it was a marriage between right. Israel and God, right? It is, it was a marriage, and in in, in uh, and Levites were not asexual either; they had children, and you know. Oh yeah, and right. and Hosea, in Hosea, there's a a, a very um, profound proposal. Where God says He's going to uh, betroth Himself to Israel, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and so so that imagery is certainly there, right? And of course, in the New Testament, and Song of Solomon, of clearly course. there, Bride of Christ, the right. Church is the Bride of Christ, and, and Song of Solomon. Solomon, and there's pomegranates in Song of Solomon, right? Yeah, so that that you know that is. That yeah. is part of the, yeah. uh, uh, you know, that analogy right. is there. To a certain extent, yes, actual biblical sexuality, biblical sexuality does in fact have a spiritual component, right? Which means it's not completely disregarded. That's kind of my point. It's not completely disregarded. We do not, you know, like I said, the Bible separates it, right? So the activity is still personal. It's 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 at your right. home. It's not involved with the corporate worship. Right. However, the fact that sexuality is involved uh, has a religious metaphor to play and things like that as a spiritual component is not negated either. It doesn't become completely removed from spirituality mm -hmm. it's kind of what i'm getting at. i feel like that's kind of the nuance why you would incorporate a symbol like that and i would also say that i think the pomegranate also is symbolic of the of the uh, the, the special land that god was going to give to his people mm. and so it'd be you know it would be symbolic of of perhaps the reward that ultimately spiritually we you know god's people have but in in that context it was symbolic of the promised land yeah and also because a pomegranate consists of many seeds, mm -hmm. was symbolic of the of the people coming together yep. as a congregation, as an other yep. uh, you know other symbolism there. Oh, there's a lot. Yeah, pomegranates are very interesting visually because there's a lot of there's a lot of eroticism to them, and and then there's a lot of uh, like fertility symbol to them and abundance and, and just a lot of things. And while we're talking about pomegranates, I th I saw a good observation about the bell. The priest mm. walked around and, and, and a bell sounded. Right. And this might be symbolic of the fact that the priest was to proclaim, uh, you know, mm. God's teachings to people. They were to, to hear right. what the priest had to say. Right. So that would, you know. Well, it's kind of like, um, it's almost the, ob I don't want to say objectification, but it's almost like a illustration of kind of what Paul says about, um, if he does not have love, he's like a clinging symbol or whatever. Oh, so it's right. like you have the symbol of the the love, the pomegranate, and then you have the bell. So you have both. That's interesting. You have both the the clanging. You know, you have you have the you, like you said, you have the proclaiming, but then you have the the, the reason behind it. You know, I don't yeah. know. Now God did make a covenant with Levi. You can read about it in Malachi, mm -hmm. and with the priest, you can read about it in Numbers eighteen. You know, so there there are covenants involved, and as I said, uh, he, he has seen to it. In my, I, I believe that the priests and Levites have have survived, and and uh, I do believe that in the millennium there will be a temple and there will be a functioning priesthood and Levites there. It doesn't mean that there will be personal sacrifices required, because we see that, that clearly no. You know, Jesus Christ is taking care of that. <laughs> well, you say clearly no. Well, I, yes. Yeah, right, but but there will be court ritual there will be priests and levites performing uh, sacrifices because here we see it, 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 before the the levitical system is introduced because of the, let's say the sins of the people mm -hmm. th there's already court ritual mm -hmm. before you get the required sacrifices for sin which seems to come which comes after the golden calf episode and right. so, so forth and all this other uh, you, uh, rebellion that you see in even in the book of exodus but before, but you know, before that system is introduced, we already have a sacrificial system, right? And, and as I said, that remains, I think, even and that went back all the way to Adam and Eve, yeah, right, yeah. right. 
Yes, you could to point. some extent. Yeah, right. Abel. And so, but so <clears throat> I do believe that that Leviticus, that Ezekiel forty through forty eight, is, is not just allegory or symbol. You know, I do mm -hmm. believe that there's going to be a literal uh, temple in the millennium, right. literal priesthood and Levites. But but that's that's that is not necessarily. But that, I believe that that has its role to play. Mm -hmm. But but obviously, what, if you read the New Testament. The personal sacrifices for sin, obviously Jesus Christ has handled that. I love how you always say obviously. You're so sweet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just because it might be obvious to us, but not everybody. So there are there obvious. are people who believe that that they should that they sh if they uh, sin and they have to bring a sacrifice in the, in the future. Theoretically, I'm yes. That's seen... the reason why they can't is just because the temple's not standing. Wow. Well, yeah. What what did they do with all those verses in the New Testament? What do they do with the sacrifice of Christ? What is that for? I, I, right, I, right. I mean, I'm not going to defend their no, own position. No, I'm not going to no. do a very good job of that. I'm no, just saying. Fair enough. I have seen I'm that. I'm sure they have their spin. <laughs> yes, they yeah, have but, their spin. It's right, not right. like they don't read the Bible. No, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. The more, All right. The more you, you get into these things, the more you realize that when somebody has a very different view, yeah. it's not like he's not aware of what you're aware of. Right. He's just taking it differently. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Um, we have a couple of questions. One question is, in verse 41, it says, You shall dress them, Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, and you shall anoint them. There was a procedure of anointing priests. What does that mean, considering it's a hereditary system? So it's not like you're choosing them. Is it like when they come of age or what would be the reason why they would need to be anointed considering they were charged with this task at birth uh, in verse 41 yeah at least that's how altar translates it and you shall dress them Aaron your brother and his sons and you shall anoint oh, oh, them and oh, you shall install them and consecrate them that they serve me as priests yeah 41 yeah it seems to me what I would get out of it, and my dad may completely correct me on this, that this is just referring to the system because at four years old, that's not going to be what happens. So I would guess you would become of age and then you would have a ceremony to recognize your role and then you would be, you know, given an assignment and, you know. I, I, I believe that the high priest was anointed. The, 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 it, otherwise it was hereditary, but this is the beginning of of the priesthood this is the inauguration of the priesthood so the anointing here is because these are the first priests ever okay so you wouldn't think this was a perpetual practice. no it was only, the high priest was anointed not every priest okay i don't I, it, it is hereditary but okay. the high priest was an anointed position so you don't think of like a bar mitzvah or something that might have done something like that just I, don't, to I, I, I doubt it okay I, I don't think so. all right here's another question so when it gets to the linen breeches and it's from the hips to the... Me, but let me just say one more thing. Yes. The high priest was anointed, as was the king. And Jesus yes. Christ, why is he called Christ? Christos. That's for the, from the Hebrew Mashiach, uh -huh. anointed. He's anointed and he's both anointed as high priest and as king. Right. He's both. Right. So, there you yeah. go. Okay. Um, so when it talks about the uh, the modesty issue with uh, mm -hmm. the nakedness the question is does this is this something that should give us some sort of biblical standard of what is modest in general or should we take this just specifically about the priest because the bible does talk about modesty right and it does talk about you know nakedness being kind of a shameful thing and certainly we could observe from nature that people get a sexual response from nudity and so therefore we should be careful but the bible does not seem to give us the specific standard as to what modesty looks like however this would at least give you a hint of it if you wanted to take it that way that uh for a man that their genital area be not generally exposed yeah i would say that uh definitely throughout the bible you see modesty and uh, and, and uh, in, implied in various ways uh and and uh, like paul says flee fornication obviously if, if if people are going around with a lot of their body exposed that's hardly fleeing fornication uh, well that's... what about people that would argue that you i mean i i, I know what you're probably going to say but there are people that would argue that you know nudity and sexuality are not 
completely link together that you know there's a difference between somebody sunbathing and somebody doing like a uh, burlesque routine because one is asking you to look at them as a sexual object whereas the other is just them being their normal self <laughs> yeah but if you're sunbathing in front of a lot of other people you know they... well your argument would be that no matter what there is a certain amount of provocation, which is, I, I would agree with you scientifically, that definitely seems to be the course, case. Yeah. And I would say biblically. So you would think that it is, it would be fair to extrapolate from this a certain standard of, just, this is about the only objective standard of modesty you get in the Bible that specifically states what being modest is. You, Otherwise, it's kind of a general principle. You would be amazed if you looked at how the average person dressed, at, let's say at the beginning of the 20th century, wow. and then how that, it's, I mean, yeah, but what about average... people that are tribes that are have been isolated for centuries upon centuries and have a very different standard of modesty than yeah, well, they're, they're you know, the, well, they're not. Do you think? But do you think that that's a reflection of greater sin or something like that, or what? You know, or is there is there a cultural component? Because, like, for example, in one era, it might have been considered incredibly indecent to, I don't know, show your foot or something. I would say modern era, if you show your foot, it's not ex expected you're going to get a very strong sexual response because we are not as accustomed to it. So there and does seem to be a cultural component to some degree. In Job 30, I, I won't go into it at length, but it talks, uh -huh. talks about people that were kind of driven out. Uh, uh, into the marginal parts of the world right you know uh, they're, they're not a, a role model you okay know, the people who you know who wound up in those areas living the way they live okay you know, head hunting and all the rest of it they're not a role model <laughs> well not all of them are like that yeah, I mean, right, I right, yeah. no 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 i understand so um so what you would say but but it's still a question right because cultural standards have changed be like right. is it uh, and and it, it goes back and forth in terms of what is a concern and things like that. So if you're looking for an objective standard, you would say at least this is a start, right? The genital mm -hmm. area being covered right, is a yeah. start. Right. Yeah, I would say. Right. As, okay. least, so far, at least still in America, you know, if you go to the... To for the, men. Well, well, but even... Yeah, for men. Even for when you go no, no, no. For women, we generally have more of a standard right. because we generally are concerned with secondary sexual characteristics such as breasts, right. whereas we are not with men. Right. So I'm saying, at least as of now in America, for example, on a beach, women's breasts are covered still. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in Europe, evidently, they already have. Beach. It varies. It's yeah, still very yeah. common for them to be covered as well. Mm -hmm. But this is not, but secondary sexual characteristics being covered is not something you can get from this passage. All you can get from this is genital area, just just, just to say. <laughs> because, you know, now you can argue men don't have the same sort of sexual sec, the same sort of secondary sexual characteristics as women because they do not breast that help with breastfeeding and things like that. So therefore it's quite different, fair enough. Uh, but you know this this does not get you that this gets you primary sexual characteristics but does not get you to secondary so you would have to go further All right <laughs> but uh but 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 you wouldn't say that people that objectively say because some people want to discount it completely and they want to say eh, this is just for the priests and so therefore eh you know they're, i don't think they're being intellectually honest okay I mean, when Isaiah, when it says Isaiah preached naked, I my impression is, is he was in this. He wasn't nude. He was like this because I don't see why God would have him be that immodest. I would say he was he was basically in his underwear, which is very weird anyway. Like if I went out and preached in my boxer shorts, people would find that very eccentric. It would get the point across. I don't necessarily know if Isaiah was nude. What do you think? Do you think he was actually nude? Nude. <laughs> You, you could be right. I, I okay. Uh, and, and it would seem it would seem counterintuitive for God to command you to do something that is immoral. So right, but but, but it it is true that the prophets did things very out of the ordinary because that that right. was their way of you know they didn't have the internet and so on. Right. right, and then and then David, I believe, when he was showing off or whatever, I don't think he wasn't wearing this. I don't think that you necessarily he was necessarily nude either. 
No, no, he just was. He was. Like, I think you could see like a, this, which like, was considered like a kilt, which could blow. Well, a kilt you often don't wear with underwear, so um, it depends on it. There's the whole idea of being regimental, which means you are not. Um, but the idea is not that you're flashing people either. So the question is: Is was he wearing something where he was flashing people and they were seeing his genital area or not? I would say I wouldn't have a reason to assume, considering. He seems to take a very strong stance that what he's doing is not wrong. Yeah. That he was wearing something like this, okay. and so the the, uh, the 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 again the just like nowadays you wouldn't expect a minister to dance around and you see their boxer shorts, right? Yeah. Um, you you know same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you think that's reasonable? Reasonable. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying that's the only way of interpreting it. Reasonable. But I'm saying it's reasonable. Reasonable. Um, you know. Again, I just like the consistency. Right. I Okay. All right. That being said, anything else to talk about before we move on? Let's, let's, move, let's on. move on. Please like, subscribe, hit the bell. It's a great year to read the law, isn't it?